Hi, I'm Philip Anthony Albertelli, and welcome once again to The Week in Doubt, a podcast for atheists, agnostics, and whoever. And I think this is episode 21. Well, if you were listening last week, then you know I had given a warning that my voice might sound a little funny because I was suffering from allergies. Well, it hasn't really gotten any better. Um, Maybe it has a little, I don't know. But it's good enough to do the show. Um, And if you're a first-time listener, I have kind of a deep, lazy voice anyway, so this actually might not be that much of a difference from my regular voice, just a little froggier. Is that an uh, actual adjective? Froggier? Anyway, you know I'm a stickler for correcting myself when I accidentally let a uh, factual inaccuracy slip by. So I have one that I've been champing at the bit to correct. Champing, not chomping, right? Uh, <laughs> um... I had briefly mentioned the Tuskegee experiments uh, a few episodes back during the episode that was mostly devoted to listener feedback. And you might be wondering why the heck was I talking about the Tuskegee experiments on a podcast that's about religion, atheism, philosophy, or whatever. It was because I had digressed into the area of conspiracy theories while I was responding to a piece of feedback I received on iTunes where it seemed like someone, it was the only negative piece of feedback I've gotten so far, and it was, it seemed like it was someone not really trying to be cruel or leveling a personal criticism at me, but it's more like they were taking the opportunity to try to promote their own podcast or a friend's podcast that had something to do with conspiracy theories. So I was talking about how I'm skeptical of conspiracy theories, um, just as I'm skeptical of the claims of the various world religions. Um, But I acquiesced, uh, conceded to the point that Yeah, of course, governments do uh, bad things sometimes, and uh, even cruel or monstrous things. And one of the examples I gave were the Tuskegee experiments, which were documented experiments where the U.S. government between 1932 and 1972 intentionally injected... uh, poor black men with uh, syphilis and uh, didn't treat them so they could kind of sit back and observe the destructive toll that syphilis takes unchecked on the human body. And where I messed up was I had referred to the test subjects as airmen or servicemen and I'm still kind of flush with embarrassment now when I think about it. This is a mistake I've made in the past, long before I before I even started the podcast, where for some reason in my mind I would kind of conflate and confuse the Tuskegee Airmen with the Tuskegee Experiments. And I guess it's understandable to a degree. The Tuskegee Airmen were a group of African-American fighter pilots in World War II, and the Tuskegee experiments were done on African-American test subjects, as I said, uh, starting in 1932. So they're kind of close together in time. Both involve uh, the area of Tuskegee, and both involve um, African-American men. So uh, I guess I'll take it a little easy on myself because I can see how you know you could get confused. But the Tuskegee experiments and the Tuskegee Airmen are two different things, and I shouldn't have characterized the victims of the Tuskegee experiments as servicemen. Uh, I don't know if any of them maybe had ever uh, served. I'm not sure. Um, But all right, so I just want to, I was eager to get that out of the way because usually I correct things right away and that one is from a few episodes ago. And I think what triggered my memory 
is I was watching a documentary that had mentioned the Tuskegee experiments and all of a sudden a bell went off in my head. I was like, "Uh uh-oh, did I um, misstate something a few episodes back? So anyway, that's taken care of. Okay. Now, um, just an update for regular listeners or for new listeners as well. I've started repackaging the old episodes and uploading them to YouTube. Since it's audio only, it's basically just the same audio you've heard before if you've listened to the past episodes. Um, But so there's at least some sort of visual stimuli. I've included the... um, the cover art for the podcast and added a few little transitional effects and tidbits of information and stuff here and there. Um, And it's basically me just trying to spread the awareness of the podcast and hopefully get some more listeners. And now that I've begun upping episodes to YouTube, I guess the big question is, will I start doing video podcasts? Uh, And I don't know. Uh, I'm hesitant for two reasons. On the one hand, I guess I'm a little shy, and I don't know if I want to put my live-action mug (laughs) upon YouTube every week. Live-action? That almost sounded like... uh, I was going to say claymation for a minute. I think that's stop-action. Kind of like Wallace and Gromit or Gumby. (laughs) Um, and the other thing is the only video equipment I really have is the, um, you know, the built-in eyesight camera in one of my Macs. Uh, I I usually record the show for the most part on my Mac mini, um, in the, I, cause I'm the graphic designer too. I have an Asus ProArt monitor. And that does not have a eyesight camera. But I do also have a MacBook Air, which has a eyesight camera. Um, So I don't know if the quality would be up to snuff if I just used the uh, eyesight camera on my uh, MacBook Air. And then secondly, I said I'm a a little shy. I don't know if I feel like... uh, putting myself up there for the world to see uh, every week. But I'll think about it. But I'm excited about having some of the episodes up on YouTube, and I've been using iMovie to do that. I've just been dragging the audio into iMovie and then adding the, um, the visuals. So I will keep doing that at least. And already I'm only... I Last night I upped the the uh, repackaged version of the second episode and already I think the graphics I chose are better it's a little bit more professional or slicker looking than the um, repackaged version of the inaugural inaugural episode that I put up so hopefully as I get a feel for dealing with the visual effects and syncing them up with the audio the finished product will continue to get better And you might ask, well, what is my overall goal with the podcast? Why am I trying so hard to get it out there? And um, I guess it's twofold. On the one hand, um, I think I have something worthwhile to say. Uh, Those who know me personally out there, um, my old friends and and, uh, acquaintances perhaps, who've known me a, a long time, know that I've pretty much always been overly philosophical, um, that I've always had uh, an interest in philosophy, ancient history, world religion, things like that. And um, and if you've been listening to the show, you know that I'm a fan of the quote-unquote new atheists and that I watch a lot of uh, debates And I've said on the show before that there might be times when I'm watching an old Christopher Hitchens debate or maybe um, watching a theologian um, debate, uh, Richard Dawkins or Sam Harris. And as smart and as eloquent as these guys are, 
um, every once in a while you might see that they left themselves a little open or they missed a chance uh, to get a good kidney shot in, <laughs> figuratively speaking, or whatever. And as like an armchair quarterback, I'd go, oh, you let them get away with that? I would have added this fact. I would have said that. I wouldn't have left myself open. And uh, so I thought by doing this podcast, it was my chance to say those things that I would have said if I was in their place or something like that. And it's definitely not to say that I'm smarter or quicker than they are, not by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, it's easy to judge someone. You know, I'm not a big sports guy, but I guess in a way this is my equivalent of uh, when people yell at the TV during uh, while watching a, the Super Bowl or a sports game or something, um, and they you're yelling at the star player because he fumbled the ball or something like that. Um, no matter how talented you are, uh, if you're, whether it's sports or you're performing live in a in a debate, uh, doing your best to uh, stay on your toes against a formidable adversary in front of a giant audience, you're going to uh, fumble here and there. Um, but while watching these debates, I just realized that I had a real passion for the subject matter, which I already knew before, but also that I had... Um, worthwhile things to add to the conversation at large regarding um, the conflict between religion and atheism or reason and uh, fundamental or religion or the literal interpretation of religion. Um, so it's not like I expect to change the world or that I think, even though what I'm saying is sincere and it's coming from my core, I'm sure whatever I have to say for the most part has been said before by smarter or more educated people. Um, but I, w I have a desire to express myself. I think I have something to add to the conversation. Um, and like everyone else, you know, I want to be heard. Uh, so on the one hand, that's why I'm doing the podcast and that's why I'm trying to spread the word. Um, on the other hand, I'm not going to lie to you. You know, a, a lot of people will try to get you to buy things or try to tell you that they're motivated by only the most noble of intentions. Um, I'm also hoping that I, I can turn this into a kind of career, a job perhaps, too. Uh, as I've said before, you know, I'm a freelance graphic designer and I make part of my income that way. And I also work for my family's home remodeling business. So um, I'm lugging around windows and bags of concrete and sacks of shingles uh, in the summer and winter and, um, you know, replacing windows uh, and doors, cutting lumber, uh, doing finish molding, stuff like that. Stuff that I'm not necessarily cut out for. Uh, I mean, I've learned a lot about the business just because I've been doing it for so long, but I'm more of the cerebral type. Um, for the most part, uh, I just have a love for contemplation and a, a, a love for creativity in general, too, whether it's poetry, music, um, creative writing, the arts, um, drawing, sketching, painting, that type of thing. Um, but one of my greatest loves is philosophizing. And that might sound pretentious, you know, referring to yourself as a philosopher. Uh, but it's it's a double-edged sword. Um, I'm proud of it, and I like the fact that I take the time to contemplate the big questions and wrestle with those issues that we all wrestle with to some extent, but some of us more than others. Um, and the older I get, the less angst is involved with wrestling with those big questions and the more I actually enjoy it and find a kind of comfort in it. Um, so if I could monetize the podcast at some point, if I could earn a living off of advertising or at least greatly supplement my income, that would be a dream come true. So that's the other reason for trying so hard to... Uh, spread the word about the podcast is I want to make that money don't we all um, 
so I mean, both on Podbean and on YouTube, you know, I've chosen to monetize. Uh, I don't think I'm allowed to ask people to click on the ads, but <laughs> but you get my drift. Um, I've been wherever I can trying to monetize the podcast. Um, and I think in this uh, tech savvy age we we live in, and the longer the internet's around, the less likely people are to click on ads, and the better people get at kind of um, avoiding all the pop ups and the ads and stuff, and just trying to go straight to the content thereafter. So I figure if I can cast a wider net, if um, I can kind of take a buckshot approach and put the podcast out there in different formats on different places on the internet and monetize the different areas, then there's more chance of not only building a sizable audience, but that people might actually check out the ads or whatever. And I get a little uh, payday as well. (laughs) So I just wanted to say that because, you know, sometimes um, maybe you'll listen to a podcast or whatever it is and people kind of self-righteously make it sound like they're doing you the favor by trying to sell you things or if you buy things from them it'll be for the greater good i'm telling you i take pride in creating my podcast and these are my sincere heartfelt beliefs i'm espousing um thinking about these things and talking about these things this is this is my heart this is what i'm all about but Hey, I also want to make some money, too. I'm not going to lie to you about it. So, anyway, I guess I should actually start covering uh, this episode's topic. Well, I sometimes find... um, Well, I've been watching, as usual, a lot of debates uh, between religious folks and atheists um, on YouTube. And there's something that's been bugging me and sometimes I think the richest or most poignant source for conversation can come from those areas where you feel kind of conflicted or uncomfortable that maybe you're not you don't even want to fully face on a conscious level um and I think I found one of those topics where I noticed this trend as I've been wa- I've been watching a lot of English based um, shows or debates recently. Uh, there's a lot of English TV shows, um, these kind of talk shows, that have had Richard Dawkins on and pitted him with people of the cloth in front of a studio audience. And I noticed both there and in you know, debates taking place at universities and stuff that there's this tendency for the people of the cloth, these uh, theologians, uh, clergy members, or whatever, well, if we're in England, maybe they're vicars, uh, um, where they'll kind of look down their noses at Richard Dawkins or others as, despite the fact that they're these very smart men, the learned men, they're scientists, they're accusing them, the atheists, that is, of being kind of childish in that they assume that religious people believe literally. And the uh, the bishop, the priest, the theologian, the uh, rabbi, or whatever, will claim that people are smart enough to know not to believe literally, and it's childish and kind of adolescent and ignorant of the atheist to be coming from the point of view that they assume religious people are kind of stupid and believe literally. Um, And this caused this point of conflict in me because I kept seeing this over and over again. Where, uh, And this is funny. um, In my own life, I've used cognitive behavior techniques to kind of help myself become more positive or deal with certain issues. And cognitive therapy is basically when you try to work through issues or um, work on yourself, not using drugs or medicines or whatever, uh, although there's nothing wrong with that, um, but 
I'm not Tom Cruise here. I don't know if you guys remember a few years back when Tom Cruise won ape on Matt Lauer for uh, not understanding the dangers of psychiatric medicine. And that's behind that is all that Scientology bull that tries to steer people away from um, uh, medicines, especially psychiatric or psychoactive medicines which can be helpful. Cognitive behavior therapy, as the name applies, it's all done using thinking and awareness, um, examining your own cognitions. And one of the things you learn with cognitive therapy is to be able to separate your thoughts from your emotions, uh, to recognize the thinking that's at the root of your negative emotions. Um, so for instance, in this case, I was feeling a little uneasy. I was feeling, um, a little vulnerable when I was watching again, again, these religious people accuse atheists of being too simple minded and thinking that people take religion literally. And I asked myself, well, what's making me uneasy? What's making me uh, uncomfortable here? What thoughts are associated with it? And what I was getting was I was thinking, well, maybe I'm the dumb one. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the religious people are already taking all this stuff figuratively. And I'm just shouting at a brick wall in vain. And there's no reason for me to be doing uh, what I'm doing. They're basically in cognitive therapy. I know this is kind of a weird tangent to go off on. Uh, once you locate the negative thought that's associated with a negative emotion, the next thing to do is to apply reason to it, you know, to put like a positive spin on it or to see where what's wrong with the thought, um, where it doesn't hold up uh, rationally or whatever. And I think this kind of uh, split between figurative and literal belief is something I was already well aware of. And it's something that I've spoken a lot about on the podcast. And so I kind of had to remind myself that even among uh, people who believe figuratively, and uh, of course this goes back all the way to the beginning of the church and beyond. You know, there were ancient Jews who had a more uh, literal approach um, to biblical texts, and there were ones who uh, believed things were open to interpretation. Um, and of course, and I covered this before and had to eat some crow because I had made some mistakes. But even in the early church, there were early church fathers, um, including St. Augustine, who didn't necessarily believe that God created the world in six literal days, rested on the seventh, that a day was symbolic for some other length of time. Or according to Augustine, I believe that all creation may have been made instantaneously and not over a period of literal or figurative days. And I've talked a lot about how the gospel writers, um, not being deceptive, it was an acceptable writing style of the time, uh, use parable and poetic license to try to tell the story of Jesus, and that partially explains why you have some contradictions between the three synoptic gospels and John, and why we even find contradictions between the synoptics themselves. And once again, if you know you, uh, you haven't been listening to the older episodes, synoptic is basically just Greek for meaning to see alike. And because Matthew, Mark, and Luke um, have a lot in common, um, they're called the Synoptic Gospels, whereas uh, John is the most different of the four, and he's so the Gospel of John isn't included uh, as one of the Synoptics, um, even though, of course, it is one of the uh, canonical Gospels. So... I've known for a long time that there's a division between figurative and literal belief. But these prominent clergymen or whatever were so insistent 
that the that people know to take the Bible figuratively, that it's just kind of a pathetic waste for the atheist to blow hot air and um, kind of admonish or chastise people for taking it literally. But it's not that simple. And uh, oftentimes uh, it'll be a rabbi. And there's uh, rabbis I really admire. Uh, I think um, Rabbi uh, Shmuley is a little showboaty. He's a little much for me, even though he's likable in certain ways. But I'm a big fan of David Wolpe, or is it pronounced Volpe? It might, I think it's Wolpe. Um, and he's a rabbi that I have fond memories of, because when I was younger, I used to love this show on A&E. I think it then moved, reruns of it moved to the History Channel called uh, Mysteries of the Bible. And I just always loved his commentary. Uh, it was so rich, so thoughtful, so thought-provoking. And I just uh, always liked David Wolpe. And, it's, uh, and it was kind of a surprise when I started to get into the new atheist that I, I would see him debating some of my favorite atheists. Um, and I think it's a mistake you can... I think more see with rabbis than with uh, Christian theologians um, where they make the assumption that the norm is to take the Bible figuratively and they assume that everyone has their same warm, fuzzy approach to the concept of God and scripture that they do, you know? Um, and I think the reason why you see this, if I can call it a mistake, why, or why you see this attitude more with rabbis, is this is something I've praised Judaism for before, is that I think Judaism focuses more on, for the most part, um, tends to focus more on ethics, family, um, devotion to God in whatever kind of rough figurative way you mean the term God um, they're more concerned with those things and tr if I didn't say it, tradition of course tradition and family very big they're more concerned with those things ethics, family, tradition uh, a devotion to some sense of God and uh, to goodness than they are worrying about the afterlife or uh, whether or not there's really a heaven or um, that type of thing. It seems that Christians are more concerned with whether things, whether scripture is literally true. They're more concerned with whether angels exist, whether we really um, live on in some afterlife, more concerned with eternal life, and uh, more concerned with a kind of concrete, literal view of God or a creator. Um, so I often find that when you see, like, in, in a debate where there's multiple debaters, maybe a few atheists versus a few religious people, when you have, um, say, a rabbi paired with some Christian theologians, I think there's a little dissidence because the rabbi will try to defend his religious um, colleagues, but the rabbi will have a more figurative interpretation of God and scripture than the uh, religious Christian sitting next to him might. So often, you know, like David Wolpe would, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, you know, uh, the kind of German uh, W, which can be pronounced as a V, I'm not sure, um, where he'd kind of chide Christopher Hitchens or someone for having too much of a, like an overly simplistic um, literal view of scripture or something like that. And uh, if you notice, you can never, even, as much as I like David Wolpe, uh, you can never pin him down on exactly what is God. Does he actually believe in a literal creator? He seems to believe that God is more this diaphanous spirit of goodness, that God is what is good in man or what is good in human nature or or something like that, but never says if he actually, and I could be wrong, I'm kind of using David Wolpe as um, 
an example to make a larger point. But from what I've seen of David Wolpe, he kind of fits this uh, description where he'll never say if he believes in a literal, sentient, self-aware creator. Um, and then I notice even with Christian apologists, maybe people like William Lane Craig or someone like that, where they will do the same thing, kind of chide the atheist for accusing people of believing literally. Um, and they'll try to use science and reason as best they can, and often they'll have to do these kind of cognitive gymnastics uh, or contortionist tricks to get it to come close to working to support their belief in an actual creator god. Um, and they'll do the, the same type of thing, like, oh, that's childish to assume that people take the Bible literally, and they'll even concede to points that I've made uh, that church fathers and theologians have been interpreting scripture in different ways for centuries, and that uh, well, this isn't true with William Lane Craig. He actually believes that the um, Gospels were meant as historical documents. He might bend a little to the idea that there's some poetic license involved, but he believes... Uh, I think, I want to be careful before I say it, I think he believes at least some of the Gospels might be eyewitness accounts where most people will accept the the more standard notion that the Gospels were written decades, the, the earliest, uh, after the death of Christ. Uh, some theologians will try to stretch things back as much as they can to try to get into that eyewitness window. Um, but I think the standard belief is that the earliest of the Gospels was even that was written um, decades after the death of Christ. Um, but a lot of uh, theologians will admit that there's inconsistencies in the Gospels, that there's uh, a lot of things are meant to be taken as parable or, as, or meant to be taken allegorically or uh, as metaphor. But then sometimes you can kind of see the fear in their eyes when this happens. <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes at the end of a debate, they'll allow not only a Q&A with the audience, but the debaters will be able to ask questions. I've seen Christopher Hitchens. I think it may have been Christopher Hitchens asking William Lane Craig, do you literally believe in the resurrection? Do you literally believe the Virgin Mary ascended into heaven and things like that? And that's when you'll usually get these people to nervously admit, yes, they believe these things. So even if they seem to have this enlightened view that certain parts of the Bible are um, open to interpretation and not meant to be taken literally, they still um, embrace some of the very fanciful um, supernatural claims of religion uh, based not really on scientific evidence that I can think of, unless you're going to try to drag something like the Turin Shroud into the argument or something. Uh, they try to accept it, um, they embrace it on nothing more than faith, their desire to want to believe. And I think it was, I was recently watching uh, an English talk show where they had pitted Dawkins in front of a studio audience against a man of the cloth. And um, I, I think, that, I forget the person's name, but he was a pretty renowned, well-known theologian and debater. And he had been making some pretty good headway or holding his ground at least in the debate with Dawkins um, and then he kind of showed his ignorance when it got around to into evolution and whether this guy had a kind of young earth view of uh, creation you know the kind of cr crazy view some people have despite what we know about uh the geological record, the fossil record, uh, what we know about uh, evolution, um, that they believe the Earth is only 6,000 years old, roughly, um, when we know that modern Homo sapiens has been around, that's us, for 
anywhere maybe between 60 to 250,000 years old. So there's definitely something wrong with your math there. Um, and the guy showed his ignorance when you know, Richard Dawkins was asking him, do you believe that at some point, you know, God basically came down and slapped a soul in an ape or whatever? And uh, the guy didn't seem very knowledgeable about even basic facts about human evolution. And he said something about how uh, we used to be Neanderthals or that we evolved from Neanderthals. And at that point, Richard Dawkins' um, jaw kind of dropped and his eyes bugged out. When, of course, Neanderthals are our cousin. We're not descended from them. Um, we actually existed at the same time, and there's some scientific debate over whether or not any of their DNA made it into ours, or if that's even possible. Um, but this guy had uh, some gross misunderstandings concerning uh, basic science and uh, evolution in particular. And um, it got a little messy when they got into the area of uh, creationism versus evolution. Um, so it seems to me, even when you have these guys that will try to shake their finger at the atheist for assuming people believe too literally, um, when you strip away all the poetic interpretation and their concession that the Bible, at least in part, is meant to be taken figuratively, they still believe um, concretely, blindly perhaps, in uh, some of the wild supernatural claims we find in religion. So it's not as, as if even figurative believers are um, have, the, have a worldview that's grounded in reason and, and uh, science, or rational belief. So it's not as if uh, it's just their poetic way of interpreting uh, the other or the experience of existence. No, they actually concretely believe in some wild stuff. Um, and then also, uh, I think it was, and I've recommended this before, there's this kind of roundtable discussion called The Four Horsemen, a two-part video you can find on YouTube. I think they're drinking, and I hope they are. I don't know why. Uh, maybe it's because I like enjoying philosophical conversation aided with uh, the tongue loosening properties of alcohol. And that's, <laughs> uh, but it's Daniel Dennett, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, and Richard Dawkins sitting around drinking something. I, I'm sorry, I just hope they're imbibing alcohol. I don't know. Uh, and they're just talking about their their views, their beliefs, their experiences with debating uh, religious um, folk of one ilk or another. And they, one of them brought up an interesting point that they all seem to agree on. Maybe it was Richard Dawkins who brought it up that, well, maybe it was Christopher Hitchens or back and forth between Hitchens and Dawkins. But anyway, the conversation, and this isn't verbatim, it went something along the lines of that the higher-ups, the bishops, the learned theologians, etc., for the most part, don't believe literally. Uh, they might accept some of the supernatural claims, if that, but they they think it's all right for them to believe figuratively. But let's say in the case of a bishop or a learned priest or something like that, um, they will still preach to their flock as if things are meant to be taken literally. So there's this kind of di dichotomy or this dissonance where um, for the theologians the learned uh, men of the cloth, of course it's all right to take things figuratively, where they don't really emphasize that you should take things figuratively when preaching to the flock. And, um, and also we should take into consideration all these kind of polls that have been done uh, when people go up to the average person on the street and ask, you know, do you believe in angels? Do you literally believe in a creator? Do you literally believe in Adam and Eve? And 
the results are usually astonishing that the, you know the average American or person in the UK still uh, has a literal belief in angels, has a literal belief in biblical miracles. Uh, so to try to chide an atheist uh, because they think that there's um, still a problem with literal belief, it seems after you examine all the facts and take, step back and take a rational look, kind of a uh, disingenuous or intellectually dishonest argument or point to make. And I don't want to seem like I'm just blowing hot air without any facts. Uh, here's one from December 20, uh, 3rd, 2011. At least that's when the news story was posted. This is from CBS News. Um, they took a poll or reported on a poll. Nearly 8 in 10 Americans, uh, out of the people polled, believe in angels. Then another one from ABC News, uh, a little further down from 2008, most Americans believe in guardian angels. Uh, Daily Mail, 2003, three in four American adults believe angels are real. Uh, <laughs> then another one, a Gallup poll, uh, Americans more likely to believe in God. Oh, okay, roughly nine in 10 Americans believe in God or a universal spirit. Well, fewer than 10% affirm in their belief that there is no God. 81% of Americans believe in heaven. Um, 7 in 10 profess belief in the devil and in hell. Um, well, that part about, what was it, 8% or something like that, only 8% affirm in their belief that there is no God. Um well, I think that low number kind of goes to something that I often talk about on the show, the overlap between agnosticism and atheism, where I think people have, it's talking of simple-minded, overly simplistic beliefs, religious people often have this misunderstanding of atheism, where they believe that an atheist is someone who claims to be absolutely certain that there is no God, um, where there is that overlap between atheism and agnosticism, where neither an atheist or an, an agnostic, most atheists, I should say, would claim that they know for certain that there is or uh, that there isn't a God. Um, the atheist might doubt the existence of God more than someone who might more comfortably bear the uh, mantle of being agnostic. Um, I think I talked about before how agnostic was a term coined by T.H. Huxley, an associate of Charles Darwin, and I think it was in part meant to be a more palatable form of uh, the word atheist, a more palatable way of saying that you doubt or you know doubt the existence of God or aren't sure. Um, so I don't know too many atheists, or now that I've delved into uh, the writings of prominent atheists now that I've watched all these atheist debates I don't think once have I ever seen an atheist claim that they know 100% that there is no God they'll say it's more like um, it's like the problem of trying to prove a negative um, if there's something you can't detect with the senses, if there's something you can't empirically prove is true you can't disprove it either because it, it can't be detected. You can't, you can't prove or disprove any wild notion, really. You know, like, that's why sometimes atheists will use the example of the flying spaghetti monster or Bertram Russell's uh, example of the um, China teapot that where he proposes that, you know, we could say there's a teapot... Um, revolving around the sun, I think it is. And uh, I think I mangled uh, the name Bertrand. I think I actually said Bertram. But hey, Bertrand Russell, yeah, he had this uh, idea uh, known as Russell's teapot or the cosmic teapot, that there was, uh, it, you could suppose there was a teapot that orbits around the sun. Uh, since then, at least, I guess they didn't maybe uh, have as powerful uh, a telescope as we do now. Uh, you couldn't disprove it. 
uh, you know, if it's some, if it was too far away to suit the naked eye or whatever, you couldn't just. Disp- uh, most of us would know logically. No, come on, someone just made that up. There's no teapot uh, going around the uh, sun, but you couldn't disprove it either. Um, and same thing with the flying spaghetti monster. You could say there's some cosmic deity out there called the flying spaghetti monster. Um, we know it's a ludicrous idea, but at the same time, once the fanciful notion is put out there, uh, you can't scientifically disprove it either. So I think a lot of atheists are in the same camp, where they concede that you can't disprove 100% the notion of God. Um, the scientific evidence isn't there either. The closest you can come is saying, well, something can't come from nothing, so there must be a God. Um, But both scientists and religious people are left with the problem of infinite regress. If you say there's a God, well, who made God? Of course, religious people say, well, God always was. Well, how do you know that? Well, my man-made religious text says so. Um, So I think often both scientists and religious people, in fairness, are left with the problem of infinite regress. But... um, you know, I did a show on something from nothing recently uh, that talks about Lawrence Krauss's idea of how nothing is really not nothing and explaining how quantum fluctuations and quote unquote nothing could have led to the creation of the universe, the Big Bang, etc. Um, I have to admit a lot of that still is over my head. Um, but I, I know that I, I'm not comfortable with the... Um, label atheist. I prefer the term non-believer because I think atheist has some negative connotations that go with it. It makes it sound like you're part of an organization or that you're 100% sure. Um, And I think also, if we're talking about whether or not you believe in God, you have to establish what you mean by God. What concept of God are you talking about? Is it a personal creator? A... um, kind of like a man who lives up in the sky uh, or at least even if they don't have anthropomorphic form some energy or force that's self-aware that's intelligent that's uh, conscious and uh, intentionally brought everything into creation are we talking about the eastern philosophy concept of a universal spirit we have in Hinduism the Brahmin Uh, Not to be confused, even though I think there is some connection with the um, creator god, Brahma, uh, a member of the Vedic trinity or Trimurti. You know, you have Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the preserver, Shiva, the destroyer. So we talk about something like that, like what we find in Hinduism and Buddhism and Zen, which is you know a Japanese flavor or <laughs> version of Buddhism, this idea of a um, kind of collective consciousness, a vague universal spirit that's impersonal in the sense that it's not a conscious creator god. Um, and I guess it might be similar to the philosophical idea of pantheism, the belief that belief that. Um, nature has a soul but there's no uh creator god in the conventional sense or in the judaic christian sense and even then if we're gonna say an impersonal god or if we're gonna say a um personal god there are myriad uh versions of each that we could go with um so i think before we're gonna talk about whether or not we believe or or don't believe in a god, you have to kind of establish which of which myriad concept of god uh, are you referring to, or which concept of the myriad concepts are you referring to. So anyway, I'm kind of proud of myself. I think I did a pretty good job of uh, dealing with uh, any insecurities I felt about the um, split between literal and figurative belief and I think uh, by doing this podcast I kind of help myself get back on track and uh, shored myself back up to fight the good fight Uh, so anyway this has been the Week in Doubt episode 21 
And as always, I would implore you to like us on Facebook. Just go to Facebook and look for The Week in Doubt. Uh, the, probably the best thing you can do is leave a positive review on iTunes or even just a star rating. And now you can also look for us on YouTube. Just look for The Week in Doubt on YouTube. All right. Thank you as always. <laughs>